morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this panel on financial planning through different life stages. My name is Sin Jing. I'm the Chief Client Officer here in Dallas, where I manage a team of client advisors across Hong Kong and Singapore. So in Singapore, money is the number one source of stress. I'm gonna... Is this better? Okay. Yes, money's number one source of stress here, and it really underscores the importance of financial planning, setting your goals, creating a plan on getting from where you are today to where you want to be. And financial planning is not just about investing, although obviously investing is a very, very important pillar of it. It's really about setting your goals, creating that plan, and as you go through life, you know, that, that could change as well. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it to my uh, fellow panel speakers here today to give a very quick introduction of themselves, as well as to share with the audience, you know, at what age did you start investing or financial planning, and what prompted you to get started? Um, we'll start with Chow on my left. Hi. Can you hear me? Does it work? Uh, okay, we'll pass you the mic. Hello. Hi, good morning. My name is Chow, and I am a content uh, creator and a host. TLDR on that is that I'm a freelancer. And I think I started planning, financial planning probably around... Okay, I can't lie. It's like this year. <laughs> but um, I did think that I was investing sometime in uni. But I think um, what I learned this year is that that wasn't really, really strategy and there wasn't real planning it was just kind of like um a little bit just going with the flow following what people were saying yeah so that's my journey good morning art my name is joy i'm a marketing head with ubs i've been with ubs for 19 years i started off as a client advisor now to the questions that sing ting asked about when do you actually start investing for me i actually start very late and 30 uh, like end of 30 years old um but they say that it's better to start late than never. Um, and you know that when you start investing and you get that compound interest, Albert Einstein said it's the eight wonders of the world, right? Um, what prompted me is also because I moved to the front line. I, I think about uh, managing clients' money and why don't I start with myself first? So for me, the, 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 the big milestone is getting that financial confidence. Um, though I have kids, I, I do all the budgeting, I do the school fees, I do the bus transport. But when it comes to investment decision, most women defer to their spouse to do it. So at that age, I thought, why don't I learn the rope and manage clients' money, and as well as managing my own money and eat my own cookies? Over to you, Chris. I'm going to try and speak through the mic. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. And just want to thank Endowers for having me here. My name is Chris, and I'm from uh, Provident. I started speculating uh, at the age of early 20s. I say speculating because uh, that was the 90s, and uh, those of us who are my age, uh, you remember the, the period in 1990s, uh, it was the period of the IPOs, right? So all you need to do is, uh, if there's an IPO going on, just go to the ATM machine, uh, buy as many lots as you can, hope that you can get it, and then once it's listed on the market, sell it, take the money, go for a good meal, and then wait for the next one. Nobody reads prospectus, you know, just buy it, <laughs> you know, you should never lose money, so they say. So that was the early 90s when I was in my early 20s. Ming Feng. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. So I'm happy to be here. I'm actually the head of Sydney. So I look after uh, Singapore's largest personal finance community. And every month, about 700,000 to 900,000 Singaporeans actually use our platform to make smarter personal finance decisions. Uh, that being said, when we talk about when did I start investing, I think it was during uh, when I was in uni. So funny story, my mom gave me $2,000. She will uh, be able to reap some profits from it. Uh, she never see that money ever again after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's my story. And I'm so open about sharing your journey. I mean, I think a lot of us here start out by really speculating, but as the previous panel shared, you know, markets can be extremely humbling. Um, and, it, and it really takes, and it's never too late to get started in your financial planning and investment journey. 
Um, so my first question here is for Chao. You know, Chao, in some of the, you know, your videos of the Taoists and in our conversations, you mentioned that you were quite an obsessive saver, as you put it, when you were younger. And you really only got more serious about investing, you know, more recently, as you mentioned, when you become an Taoist client as well. And can you walk us through that process of, you know, saving more and then wanting to invest now? I'm not sure if you've seen the videos. I was told that it was played on repeat, but I was a little bit like, oh man, I can't show my face. Because <laughs> in the video, it really starts off with this hook, which I have to say, props to the marketing team, they did so well with the video. It really started off with me going, I had 40, 48 cents in my CPF account. And I wasn't kidding. Um, I really did only have 40 something cents in my CPF because I had a little bit of a, um, well, I'll call it a hiccup with HDB and I had to forfeit my HDB flat and oh, wow. that left my CPF just drained completely. And I have to say that it was definitely a trigger in pushing me to plan my finances better. I think it tossed me in the deep end and it was a bit of like a, I guess a personal crisis that got me there. But prior to that, I had always been you're right, very um, thrifty, very, very obsessed over saving money because I think I grew up um, just feeling like I needed to hoard my money. I think the only idea that I had to gain wealth was to save, but I didn't know that I could get my money, I could kind of let my money work for me also. And what changed my mindset was uh, growing up, learning more about life, like losing your house, and uh, and also just changing of life stages, so planning ahead. And I think right now I'm in a space where I am planning forward. So I'm thinking about things like, what about my future? Like, how do I go about affording to buy my own place? Uh, how do I plan my retirement? And when I started getting these questions, it made me think, about how I can better use my money and how can I, well, start investing. So when I did start um, my journey with Endowers, I, my, my Endowers financial advisor talked me through my objectives in life. Pretty much like a, I mean, it's kind of odd to ask like a 20 something year old what you want in your life. Cause honestly, the question would be like, I don't know lah. Like that's, that's just how it's gonna be. I like legit don't know what I wanna do, but I roughly have an idea of, uh, I think it would be nice to have home ownership in Singapore. I think it would be cool if I could retire early, but I don't know if that's even possible. I think it's all about setting these goals and then trying to build the steps and working towards them. So what Endowers has helped me done and my financial advisor, who unfortunately isn't here because she, yeah, she's ill, but I really was looking forward to seeing her, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so what they've helped me do is break down I think baby also wanted to see her. It's okay. <laughs> so what Endowers has helped me do is to break down the steps to help me reach these goals. And I guess these goals were um, kind of new, like in this stage of my life. So that's where I got there. And how my mindset shifted from just purely uh, hoarding money and saving to investing was when I understood that saving will not be able to beat inflation and well, eventually my savings is just gonna, well, what's the term for it? <laughs> Not depreciate, but like... Eroded. Yeah, that's the <laughs> word. <laughs> so it'll erode over time and it just uh, will be a bit futile. Like all my effort would be a bit futile and it'll go to waste. And I did um, think that it would be better to just let they always tell me this, but I just can't get the words out. They always tell me, let the interest compound over time. And I guess time's kind of what I have now. So I'm using that to my advantage. Thank you, Chow. Yeah, I'm sure taking that, that first step is always, always the scariest. Um, and it's a good segue to Joy for our next question. You know, a lot of people struggle with thinking about their immediate financial needs and their longer term goals like retirement. Retirement can seem a faraway concept for many people in this room today. So, you know, how do we strike the right balance between thinking about our short term goals and yet our long term financial planning through different life stages? That's a good question, and I think um, the audience here probably think about it. That's why you're here, right? 
um, having that strategic asset allocation, which the panel in the first panel talked a lot about it in UBS and uh, as I work through the client's portfolio, that strategic asset allocation is important. It drives 80% of that portfolio performances. So first thing first, you need to get a client advisor, get someone who can help you through this uh, financial journey and walk through with you in different stages of life, right? I mean, that's first thing first, you need to do that, right? Second thing that is um, easier to do for me is in 2019, UBS actually came out with this report. We call it 3L. That means you bucket your investment into the 3L, which is liquidity, longevity, and legacy. So the first bucket, liquidity, is for investment that could you know, have an investment time frame of two to five years. Anytime you need it in terms of emergency, that liquidity buckets will give you that liquidity. Then the second bucket is the longevity bucket. That means that money that you set aside for retirement, that money potentially that could grow at 6 to 8% per annum, and using that concept of compounding interest, simple math that we learn in school, rule of 72, if that S&P 500 historical return at 10% per year, and based on rule 72, 72 divided by that rate of return equals to about seven years, that's the answer, your returns will compound. So if I put in 100,000 in that S&P 500 based on rule 72, in seven years, it will be compounded to 200,000. In the 14 years, it compounded to 400,000. So what I'm trying to drive at is that in that, longe uh, in that longevity bucket, I, I want to maintain my lifestyle. I still want to go on a holiday. If I'm going on holiday once a year, I still want to continue doing that. If I'm having a helper now when I retire, I still want to continue to have a helper to help me trim the plants or to, you know, that lifestyle changes cannot be happening when I retire. I should enjoy my lifestyle, right? So that's the longevity bucket. Now, the legacy bucket is investment that you probably won't need in your lifetime and you would like to pass it on to the next generation. So it can be like what Charles said, a home that you want to pass it on to the next generation. It could be easily our friend from Providence, Pod Christopher. It can be an insurance policy that you never needed in your lifestyle, in your lifetime, and you pass it on to the next generation. It can be the alternatives, the private equities, the hedge funds, which my colleague Melanie will speak about it later, that you, you probably lock it up for a longer time, 10 years or more, but you, you potentially have the alpha in investment return, and you pass it on to a lifetime. So to, 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 uh, to Cynthia's question is, uh, strategy as allocation, one should have in a portfolio because that's what we do best. That, that's how we don't time the market. We potentially compound the interest. But on our own Excel spreadsheet, when you look at your own network, you probably just bucket it into three buckets, liquidity, longevity, and legacy. I hope I make some sense. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, Joy. I mean, you work with really ultra high net worth clients and family offices on a daily basis. Um, but I think the framework that you shared with us is very applicable to everybody in the room today, too. Um, and you, and maybe this is a good segue to Chris, um, Christopher. And when Joy mentioned um, insurance as part of legacy planning, and insurance is a big part of what um, you do at Provident for your clients. And for those that don't know, I mean, Provident was really one of the pioneers in Singapore for conflict-free advice. Um, you know, when you think about protection, do you think Singaporeans are paying, you know, too much or too little for insurance coverage? And, you know, what are the differences between whole life and term? And what do you think is right for individuals at different life stages? Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, no, I think I'll take the first question first, whether Singaporeans are paying too much for insurance. I'll say generally, yes, I think we are paying too much, but that does not mean that uh, we are adequately protected because we pay a lot for premiums, but because we buy a lot of a lot, a wrong insurance, and therefore we may not be sufficiently covered. But I think over the years, over the last 20 years, I mean, that has improved a lot, uh, especially among the younger generation, and I think they are beginning to understand what insurance is for. I do see a lot of improvement in that area. Now, to answer the rest of the questions, maybe I'll approach it this way. First, we need to understand that the primary purpose of insurance is for protection. That is why it is called insurance, right? It's for protection. 
Because if you want to save and invest, there are better instruments out there to save and invest. Insurance is a very lousy instrument for you to save and invest. It's a very expensive way to save and invest. The returns are not interesting at all. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot buy insurance to save and invest. There are people who should buy insurance to save, but for most of us, that's not a good insurance or that's not a good instrument. Right? So the primary purpose of insurance is for protection. So then how can we insure ourselves in the smartest way? Three things that we need to know before we buy insurance. First, we've got to ask ourselves how long we need the insurance. Second, how much? Third, we then buy what type of or we then buy the type of insurance that's suitable for us. So how long, how much, what type? How long do you need insurance protection? Well, if you're buying insurance for the purpose of replacing your income loss in the event of death, disability, and a, or a medical crisis, you only need it temporarily. This is because there will come a point in your time or in your life whereby you will no longer need an income replacement. For example, you have achieved financial independence, you are retired, or you've got no more dependents, you don't need to replace your income anymore. So if you're buying insurance for the purpose of replacing your income loss in the event of death, disability, or a medical condition, you only need it temporarily. Then what type? Well, if you are only covering your risk for a temporary period of time, term is probably the most suitable, right? Because it's temporary cover. And if you worked out how much insurance you need, you'll realize that actually, if you are young, the amount of coverage you need is actually a lot, a million dollars maybe. And if you try and buy that with whole life, you will never be able to cover it adequately unless you are prepared to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year. So term is the cheapest way to cover yourself adequately. I'm sure many of us have heard of buy term, invest the rest and all that. Perhaps I should say that buying term is not for the purpose of investing the rest. Buying term is because it is the most, it's the most affordable way to cover yourself adequately. Right? So does that mean that there is no use for whole life? No. Let's go back to how long do you need. If you are buying insurance to pay for medical expenses, such as hospitalization expenses, or, for example, a critical illness, then you will need this kind of insurance for as long as you live. Right? Because whether you are 30 years old, 50 years old, 70 years old, if you are sick, you want to have insurance to fall back to to pay your medical expenses. How much do you need then? Well, if you are buying hospitalization insurance, for those of us who are Singaporeans, PR, even foreigners, right, you can buy integrated shield plan. So you buy the plan that is suitable for the ward that you want to stay. So if you want to go, to, you want to have an option to stay in the private hospital, buy a plan that allows you to do that. Right? How about um, covering for alternative medicine? Because sometimes hospital plans don't pay for alternative medicine, for example, TCM. How much do you need? I'll say maybe 100,000, 200,000 is sufficient. So how long? Whole life. How much? Buy the hospital plan that's suitable for the ward. And if for critical illness, maybe 100,000, 200,000, then what type? Then you do need to buy a whole life, right? Because you want to cover it permanently for life, right? So that's how you assess what type of insurance you need. And at different age group, you decide what kind of insurance actually do you need. If you are right, very young, your need for insurance is actually very, very low because you have very little liabilities. If you die, nobody is going to miss you. I mean, nobody is going to miss you financially. Okay? <laughs> I hope. I hope people miss, I hope some people miss you emotionally, okay? But for the younger ones, right, if you passed away, very few people are going to miss you financially. So your, your need for insurance is actually very low. Just have a good hospitalization insurance and maybe a critical illness plan. I think that's sufficient. But as you move into life and you get married, you have children, you have mortgages, you have liabilities, then you really need to buy insurance to replace your income loss in the event of death, disability, medical uh, expenses and all that. Right? And then as you age and you go into retirement, again, your need for insurance drop. Because when you are retired, you are financially independent, you are no longer earning an income. I mean, there's no income to replace in the event of death, disability, or medical condition, right? Mm -hmm. So for those of us who are retired, what is most important is to have a very good medical plan. Right? Because in all likelihood, that's the age. I'm not saying that we don't fall sick when we are young, but as we age, chances of falling sick becomes higher. We need to have a very good medical plan to give us that option to seek out the best possible medical care. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Christopher.
um, for Ming Feng, you know, you engage a lot with the Sealy community. You know, what are some of the top questions that you see when it comes to financial planning and investing? And, and do these concerns typically evolve when you know people are moving through different life stages, like having their first child or buying their first house? Okay, so uh, I think for more context right now on the Sealy platform, we have about close to seventy to eighty thousand discussions. Uh, in fact, if so I need to do my homework, right, since I'm here. So I did a quick check just now. The latest discussion about NRS is eight days ago. And this month there was uh, numerous uh, discussion around it. So it's pretty interesting. I think, uh, number one, uh, thanks to, I wouldn't say thanks to COVID, but I think when the work from home situation happened, the lockdown happened, it accelerated the habit of going online to find out more information uh, uh, and discuss accordingly uh, your various situation personal, in terms of personal finance. So that's one. Next, over the years, we have also noticed that, uh, in fact, the, the audience, uh, people today, they are more than happy to discuss their financials online. I think if you look at, um, maybe for me, my parents' generation, that was something that they would not be comfortable with, right? I mean, if you go to them and say, uh, Papa, how much you have here? You think, hey, you're trying to so what is it? You know, you're trying to curse me, is it? So I think the, the whole entire stigma of uh, opening up to discuss your finances have changed. We are starting to see very in-depth questions across uh, various uh, multiple verticals. So I'm going to share a few things that uh, have happened over the year, uh, a few trends that we spot, that we spotted. Uh, number one, I think in the year 2019 and 2020, definitely there's a lot of hype around cryptocurrency. Uh, we see a huge influx of discussion around cryptocurrency. Just this year alone, we have 49,000 discussions on general investing. And a lot uh, is no longer about just stocks. They are talking about platforms to use, uh, which is uh, platforms like Endowas is being discussed quite uh, uh, a lot on the community. They are talking about specific portfolio they have with some of these platforms. They are talking about fees. So I think generally, because of the access to some of these financial products, um, people are more well-versed today financially in terms of uh, tools that's available to them and what they can do. And from there, they, uh, they also know that Personal finance uh, is very personal, right? So uh, what works for me may not work for, for certain people. So I can read a blog article on, or I can read an article on uh, various uh, personal finance related uh, products that I think might be suitable for me, but it's always important that I open up the conversation to someone who's in a similar situation to see whether there's something for me or not. So these are trends that we, we uh, uh, starting to spot, and I think it will continue. And it's actually a good sign that uh, everyone is more and more uh, financially literate. I mean, knowledge really is power, and it's quite amazing how some of the platforms like Seedly have grown the last few years. And it really shows how much interest people have in financial literacy and gaining more knowledge in the space. Um, we're getting actually a lot of questions coming in on Slido, so I'm going to jump straight into them. And I'm looking at the ones that are most upvoted first. Um, maybe for Christopher to start, you know, how often should we revisit our financial plans? After we've created a plan, do we go back to it every year, every month? Um, what do you think is the right kind of cadence? Yeah, I suppose if you are investing for the long term and you are planning for yourself for the long term, I would say, I mean, at least that's what we do with the clients. Yeah. Um, I think you should review your progress on a yearly basis. Right. I mean, look at your plan that you have put in place uh, at the start uh, of the year or when you, uh, I mean, it may not have to be the start of the year, but when you, after you put in place a plan. 12 months later, I think it's a good time to look at whether you're, not, you're, keeping, on to, uh, you're keeping with your budget, uh, how your investment is performing, um, whether you are uh, um, you know, close to what you expect it uh, to be. I don't think you need to review your insurance every year um, I think a good time to review your insurance when you, is when you have significant changes in your life. For example, you know you have a huge, you have a significant pay jump, uh, birth of a newborn, um, and things like that. I don't think there's a need to review plans um, every year. Uh, a lot of times, if you get a call that your advisor wants to review your plans, you usually know what that means. <laughs> that usually means that you need to buy another product, <laughs> right? But, but I don't think you need to do that so frequently, especially where insurance is concerned. Yeah. Thank you. 
We have a bit of a personal question for Chow, so I hope this is okay to ask you. <laughs> so what does your portfolio comprise of? I like this question because I, I was um, pretty excited to put them together. It was the first time I had laid out my finances with a professional and she had insights into what I wanted. From there, she could advise me about what best to choose. So I have two portfolios. The first one is for buying a house or a home. I think a home, right? Home is like where there's the feeling and all that. Okay, by buying a home. And then the second portfolio is for retirement. So the buying a home one is a little bit shorter term. So we're looking at a... Uh, looking at a time horizon of about two years, one okay. to two years. And for that, it's less risky. So she helped me to uh, adjust and make sure that it's not into... Like riskier ones would be stocks. Mm. So she, that's not a equity-heavy portfolio. But for retirement, it is uh, mostly in equities. And that's because I've got a much longer time horizon. So um, that's the main two portfolios I have. I feel like they are quite different from each other, just because the main difference being the time horizon that I have to work with. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your very personal All good. <laughs> portfolios. Um, moving on to Joy, um, you know, in terms of asset allocation, you know, Endow us and other advisors, they usually talk mainly about, you know, equities and fixed income. You know, what are your views on adding things like gold and commodities to um, one's core portfolio? Do you think there is a place for it? Yes and no. So in terms of strategy as allocations, we could put it in the bonds, we could put it in the equities. Um, lately now, when I've worked with individuals as well as family office, as well as even charities, associations and schools, uh, they're increasingly looking at endowment style of investing. That means as much as 20% of the portfolio, up to 40% of the portfolio goes into the alternative space. These are your hedge funds, these are your private equities. And this endowment style portfolio concept comes from the Yale Endowment University, the Princeton Endowment University. So what they do is they have a lot of funds in the school and they put it into all these uh, alternatives as much as 40%, and they publish the returns on a yearly basis, and we're looking at about 12 to 14% per annum kind of return, which is not bad, right? So a, a lot of us, uh, investors are starting to think that maybe potentially I can do 20% or 40% on portfolio instead of that, and when you lose less, the chances of you making up in a market that is down is also easier, right? So gold and commodities. Uh, yes, it's part of that as allocation, but be mindful. I cannot buy barrels and barrels of oil. I can buy gold, um, but it's also an opportunity cost in that sense because it doesn't pay me dividends. It doesn't pay me coupon like a bonds or a DBS shares that pays me dividend as well. So to, my, to your question, if in terms of war's time, like, Russia and Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, people talk about gold, people talk about oil, and see where it goes. It is a, more like a small allocation in a portfolio, but it doesn't need to be a meaningful size, if, if, if I can summarize that. Thank you, Joy. Um, you know, for, for Ming Feng, so we have someone who asked, I'm age 29 now and thinking about how to fire by 39, which I know is a very hot topic on Seedly, right? Um, I've been working for three years. I think about my savings, my spending rate, my investments, growing and proving myself to progress in career as well as pursuing side hustles. What else should I be thinking about? Okay. Yeah, so that's the kind of question we receive every day. Very specific age <laughs> and uh, objective. Some even tell us the, the amount of savings they have. So I think uh, I had this conversation actually with uh, the work salary man a while back. Uh, we met at a, pa uh, a panel and I think First and foremost, f fire is a concept that I think most of us want to have, but you also need to ask yourself, uh, what does fire mean to you? Uh, is that something that you are actually looking forward to? Give you an example, if I am fired by tomorrow, right, I will be lost. I will not know what to do. Is that the lifestyle that you want? That's one. Number two is when you understand what does fire means to you, then you can work backwards to calculate the kind of um, 
expense and the kind of savings, the amount that you need. So I think uh, a few years ago, we did a bit of a study uh, and then we and research and we noticed that actually, uh, that was about three to four years ago, you need about $1,200 per month uh, to retire, to just spend on your basic uh, expenses. Means no holiday, nothing, just basic, $1,200 per month. Fast forward today, I believe that amount could be close to $2,000. Uh, I, would, I haven't do the math, but if you think of it this way, it means that if you are trying to uh, retire in 10 years time, the amount of savings you require is going to be way more. You need to take into account this uh, potential increase in the cost of living. And then you need to take into account what kind of lifestyle you, you want. If you want to go on holiday every year, how much you need to spend. So all these are actually factors that we are, you, you should try. So it's a bit like uh, sorting out your portfolio. It's just that now you have like these baskets of uh, savings for various items that you need uh, when you retire. Last but not least, on top of side hustle and uh, of course, protecting our downside with insurance. Uh, how are you going to constantly generate income when you say decides not to work tomorrow and, and, mm -hmm. and, and retire, right? So that, that portfolio that you're building, uh, what's, the, what's the risk and uh, what's, what's the returns that you potentially can get? Is it predictable and stuff like that? Mm. Can I just chime in a bit on fire? Yes. So yesterday I was doing a, a talk for a charity on fire. Not sure how many, or ev whether everyone here knows what's fire. Generally, this term is more familiar with the younger people. So I asked this whole group of people, and then one side was younger people, and they all put up their hands and say, yeah, I know what's fire. And the other side said, what's fire? <laughs> right? So fire stands for financial independence, retire early. A person who believes in this whole philosophy of fire, well, they earn a good income, but they'll scream and save you know, as much as they can. So they, they, in a way, delay gratification. They, they spend very little now. They save as much as they can. They invest aggressively, hoping that they will be able to achieve financial independence at a very young age, like 35, 40 years old. Now, this concept, well, it sounds really good, but I, I just wanted to, to, to share a word of caution because unfortunately, all of us, we don't have a contract with God. Life is not like that, right? We don't, you know, work very hard or study very hard and then work very hard and then we retire and we live happily ever, loved, uh, ever after. Life is not linear. Life is uncertain. We can die today. We can die in one month's time. Right? So if we delay everything to the future, there might not be a future. Right? So it's actually very important in pursuing fire to think about things that actually I do need to spend on today even though I can't fire at the age of 29, 30, 35, because there are things that cannot be delayed uh, uh, into the future. For example, going for a good holidays with your family to build memories with your young children. By the time they, my kids are 25 and 21 years old, it's very difficult to get them to go on a holiday today. If I want to go to Taiwan, they say only old people go there. We don't go to <laughs> Taiwan. They don't want to go with me anymore. They want to go with their friends, right? And I want to build memories when they are still young. Well, when our parents are around, we want to really, really lavish on them. Both my parents passed away the last, uh, last two years. Even if I want to do that for them today, I can't do that for them today anymore. There are purposeful things that you may want to do today, like giving. Right? Yesterday, the charity was on helping the people break the poverty cycle. I can't wait 10 years later to help these people. So in fire, while the idea is good, uh, please do not scream and save too much. Unless, uh, until you deny yourself a life today because life really doesn't start in the future. It starts now, right? So I just wanted to talk a bit about fire in that regard. Yeah. Just to chime in a bit. So these are the little topics that we talk to our clients about. What matters to you now and who is important to you? So these are live questions, but I guess once we have the answer, we know how to properly plan. Yeah, no, th thank you. And I, and I really like the point that you made, Chris. I mean, I, I have a one-year-old daughter and I have to always remind myself that, you know, it goes by so quickly. It really, really does and you don't want to, and once it goes by, it's very hard to turn back time. Yeah. Um, we have quite a few questions on insurance, Chris, so oh, I'm going to okay, sure. combine them into one for okay. you. Um, so firstly, how do you define spending too much on insurance? And do you think investment companies are making term insurance more expensive now in response to people talking a lot more about buy term and invest the rest? Yeah, so um, because insurance is for protection, it is an expense. Buy as much as you need, but spend as little as you can. So I cannot say there is, I don't like rule of thumb for insurance that you should you know, cover, uh, uh, spend a certain percentage of your salary on insurance. 
Um, because if you don't need it today, even if you buy a $1,000 uh, premium insurance every year, you're spending too much. Right? So there's no definition. If you don't need it, you buy it, you're spending too much. Right? Now, um, term insurance is actually getting cheaper. Right? It's not getting more expensive. It's, been, it's, be, it's become very competitive over the last uh, 10 years. Companies like um, Sing Life, in the past Aviva, uh, they were the ones, um, maybe 10 years ago, that gave a huge discount on term insurance. So I'll just say that no, it's really not um, becoming more expensive. Actually, it's becoming cheaper. Uh, and for those of us who, are, who have served national service, one of the cheapest insurance you can buy, as you all know, is the MHA MINDEF group term plan. If you don't have it, please go and buy it. It's very cheap. Ladies, if you want to buy it, marry someone who has served NS. <laughs> promoting NS. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all the time we have today. Um, thank you so much to our panel speakers for being so open and sharing your expertise and thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.